you got your Bibles, you want to open up to Isaiah. Uh, we are looking at the four different servant songs, as they're called, that we find in the uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, as you go through um, that that book, that prophecy, whatever you want to call it, the message that Isaiah has to give for the people that we recorded here in, in what we call the book of Isaiah for us, uh, this idea of the servant is a repeated motif that we'll see over and over and over again. And it's used of different people. Uh, it's used of the nation of Israel. It's used of a lot of different things. That, uh, sometimes it becomes confusing who he's talking about at which given time. Um, and oftentimes he's talking about sort of a layered approach. Uh, some of the things are about Israel and about the Messiah uh, at the same time almost, uh, and what he will do for one and will do for us uh, as they overlap. Uh, if you remember back when we were uh, studying the prophets a while ago, Patrick had this uh, image or this metaphor sort of that we used of looking at the mountains, right? And the things you see close up with detail and then a little further out are harder to see and a little further out a little harder to see and understand. Uh, and that's kind of how the, the prophecies are here. Uh, but there are four different times that there are poems or songs that Isaiah will record for us uh, in his book. And we find those in 42, in 49, uh, in chapter 50, and in 52 and 53. Uh, 53, which we always start in 53, but the song really starts in 52. It's probably the most famous to us. Uh, but last week we looked at the one that we just had read for us a minute ago by Chris that we find in Isaiah 42. Uh, one through nine, where the theme there is sort of God's perspective announcing this coming servant. Uh, and he does it in the way talking that the servant will bring justice. And the theme is there is sort of justice. They will bring justice not only uh, to the peoples, right, that not only it will be anymore the people of Israel, but those that are far off will have a light shown to them as well. Uh, but also this justice that the glory belongs to God and not to idols. His glory he will not share with another. It is right for glory alone. Uh, to be to the Father. And so uh, as we look today, we're going to look in chapter uh, 49, and we're going to see this song where the theme there, or the idea we might say is sort of the song of salvation, uh, the salvation that's going to be brought by the servant. And as you look at these different songs, uh, what you might think about or what you might do, I saw in some of the study, someone had this interesting idea uh, to think about it as there's this mystery guest, if you will, that's being introduced uh, in, in the songs of Isaiah. And each one sort of gives you a picture of who this servant is and what he's about. So you can sort of identify who this one is that he's speaking of. Uh, and that's true. And so in the first one, we saw sort of his introduction. And today we'll see more about his mission and his work and how uh, God has called him uh, to this work. And so we're going to start uh, by looking at Isaiah chapter 49. We'll read verses 1 through 3, where we sort of see the introduction here. Uh, of the second song. And so as we look at that, here's what it says. It says, listen to me, islands. Pay attention, people who are far away. The Lord called me from the womb. From my mother's belly, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And so as we open up this section, we see what's happening here in the second song. Uh, it begins with sort of the call of the servant, right? And we immediately sort of notice, if you were comparing to what Chris read a minute ago for us, we immediately notice a different perspective that's presented to us here, right? Uh, in the previous one, it was God speaking, right, in that song. And here in this one, what we see is that it is the servant himself who speaks, right? Uh, it's the servant voice uh, that this song begins in, right? He says, listen to me, and we might think it's God, but then he says what? The Lord said to me, right? And so this is not God who's speaking. This is the servant uh, announcing in his own voice what God had spoken about him. And he speaks, notice, to an interesting group. He speaks to the islands and the people who are from far away, uh, which again is an interesting or different perspective because many of the times uh, we have these ones who are speaking for God, they're speaking to who? They're speaking to the people of Israel. They're speaking to the nation. They're speaking to God's own people. But here it's very clear, this message is, hey, all of you out there, all of you Gentiles, all of you that are far away from God, listen up to what it is that I have to say. And the language that's used, if you're familiar with the Old Testament and specifically the prophets, uh, the language that's used here is sort of the language of a prophet, right? Uh, oftentimes we'll see this idea expressed when God calls out to one of the prophets of old. Uh, he will say different things, but he's selected them, he's chosen them, he's called them since before they were born, right? He's set them aside for a purpose uh, from birth. And we see that same idea expressed here 
uh, by the servant. The Lord called me from the womb. From my mother's belly, he named me, right? It's very prophetic language that's used. He talks about the mouth being like a sword. Again, language of the prophets when the sword is the word of God that's proclaimed out amongst the people and this arrow, its accuracy uh, and its polished nature. These ideas that words are weapons, again, are the ideas of the prophet. And so as we see the servant being more introduced to us here in this second song, uh, we get the idea that the servant will come and he will be a prophet for God. He will speak something that God has to say. And so when he says, listen to me, and then he tells you, this is what God has said, we see that prophet motif sort of carried out. And what we notice about this prophet, what we notice about this servant here, is that idea that he has been called by God. This is not something that the servant chose for himself. The message of speaking out to the Gentiles and the nations afar is not something that he chose. It's something that God set up as a work for him before he was even born. This will be your mission. God has chosen him. And he's chosen him to be a voice to those who are far away, right? Uh, we see a lot of times where God will come and he will talk and he'll pick a prophet and he says, go to so-and-so and speak this message, right? That's a fairly common motif uh, if you look in the prophets. Uh, and in this case, his mission is best basically to all, to all of the world, to all of creation. It's not the word of the Lord spoke concerning Edom, right? It's not the word that the Lord spoke concerning Judah. He says, tell it abroad, tell it all of the places that there are. And the purpose behind that is revealed for us as well. Notice what he says there. He says, uh, you are my servant Israel in whom I will what? Be glorified. The purpose that the servant has to spread this message out abroad is to bring glory to God himself. And that's important for us to remember because as we see the message laid out, as we see the purpose of the servant, which I've already hinted at here, right, by the title of the lesson, uh, and when we see the mission of the servant, we might say his purpose in spreading this message, his purpose in bringing this out to the people from afar is to bring them close for their benefit, right? We might assume that's his purpose. And while that's true that we benefit from it, it's not the purpose that the servant has. The purpose is to bring glory to God. So as we see this introduced to us here, we're going to see what happens or how the servant now continues to speak in his own voice and tell us what he thinks about that uh, call, what he does with that, how that works out for him, if you will. And so as we look at verses 4 through 6, we see the servant continue to speak, and he says something that might surprise you, you know, unless you're familiar with the language of the prophets, because this happens a lot there as well. Uh, but look at verses 4 through 6 as the servant continues to speak. He says... But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and futility. Yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward uh, with my God. So now the Lord said, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and to gather Israel back to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. And so he says, it is too trifling or too little a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. So I will give you also as a light for the nations that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. As we look and see what the servant says, we have sort of here the servant's testimony, right? What the servant will say. We had this call at first. Now he's going to tell us effectively uh, what he thinks about that and what God has told him concerning those things. He's going to testify about the things of God. And we'll see this sort of structure carry out. At the end, God will testify or give his testimony as well concerning the servant. But even here, notice that when the servant says, or when we hear God speaking, it's still the servant relaying to us, right? God said this, so it's still his voice that's speaking. But what does he say of himself? The first thing he says of himself is, I have labored in vain, right? I have done all of this work and it's been for emptiness. It's been vanity. And again, we, we see this idea repeated in a lot of the later prophets where God will tell them right up front, hey, listen, I'm going to give you this mission. You're going to go talk to my people and no one's going to listen to you, right? He'll, he'll tell them that right out of the gate. And so when we see this here, it's this same servant motif and the same prophet motif we see expressed uh, in the Old Testament, in the law, where the servant comes, he works out the will of God and he says, I have given my strength, I've spent it for nothing. 
And why does he say that? Why does he feel that way? Is it because he's failed in his mission? No, the reason he says that is because the, the human justice that he deserved was not given to him, right? He came and he gave the message of God. He spoke these things out. And what he deserved to get from mankind was he deserved for them to say, oh, glory to you, great prophet. Thank you so much for bringing us the word of the Lord, right? When God picks a prophet and says, go speak to this people, You'd like it to always work out in such a way that they heard the message, they repented in sackcloth and ashes, and God was praised and glorified, right? That's what, that's what the prophet would like to have happen, but it's not what happens here. He doesn't get the type of justice that he deserves. And we know that because instead he says, where does his vindication and his justice come from? He says, it will be with God. No one here liked what I said. The people that I was sent to will not hear me but God will be my justice. He will be my vindication. My reward is with him, right? And as a result of this, right, as a result of this idea that his justice was not given by man, that what he deserved he did not get, he was not treated fairly, but instead his reward was with the Lord and his vindication and justice will come from him. As a result of that, the servant testifies, right? He says about God what God spoke concerning him, right? So there's sort of this idea uh, that he says, listen, I'm going to call you. I'm going to give you this mission. You're going to do this thing. You're going to be unsuccessful. And because of that, let me tell you some things concerning yourself, right? And so we see those things laid out for us. What he says is, you will restore the nation of Israel. When you go and you speak and you say these things, it may look as though you're unsuccessful, but my people Israel who have forsaken me, you will restore them. They will be brought back to me. Secondly, he says, you will be honored in the sight of God. Even if man does not honor you, even if those that you go to speak to do not uh, proclaim good things about you, you will be honored and esteemed in my sight. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly to us, he says, you will bring salvation to those that are afar. You'll bring salvation to the Gentiles as well. And the reason there is, I don't know what the right word is, poetic. Uh, it's beautiful in its expression, right? When we think about God and who he is and the mission that he has, what he effectively says to the servant is, sir, you're going to go out and you're going to bring this message of salvation and you're going to restore the people of Israel. And he goes, okay, sounds good. He goes and he does that mission. He says, no one listened to me. No one listened to me. I spent all of my life and my strength for nothing. And God says, that's okay. Because Israel was too small. We weren't thinking big enough. It's almost the mindset there, right? Uh, and now, if you had gone out to someone and you had done this work in some place and you felt unsuccessful, right? Let's think about that. You were given a job and you go out, let's say you're, you're made sales manager of a region. Right, you go out and sell our product, whatever it is. What is it in the, the Jetsons, like Space Lee Sprockets or whatever. Right? Go, out, go out and sell these to all the people in this region. You say, okay, you go out and you sell and you sell and you sell. And you have no success. And you come back to your manager and says, I, I did everything you asked. It was for nothing. And his response is not, well, you're a terrible salesman. His response instead is, you know what? I think we weren't thinking big enough. I'm going to promote you and make you sales manager of the world. You get all of it. We were, we were thinking too small. And that's kind of the idea that's expressed here. Because redeeming Israel was not big enough. Because that was just a trifling or small idea in the eyes of God. To redeem Israel is a small thing in God's sight, right? He says, instead, I will also send you out and cause you to redeem and bring salvation to all the nations around. You will bring it to all of the peoples as a light for the nation you will be salvation to where? To the ends of the earth. Because Israel's salvation is too small a thing for what I've given you to do. And so as we push then and see how the response of that or what happens because of that, uh, the servant has testified concerning these things. Uh, you might think, if I, was, if I was telling this to you, right? If I came along and said, God gave me a mission, and I went and I did it, and it didn't look like I was successful, but trust me, God's on my side. And in fact, he promoted me. Right? You might be like, mm, that sounds a little suspicious, right? Sounds a little fishy. I don't think that's right. Are you sure about that? And so uh, sort of imagining this right from God's perspective, perhaps, what we see is God will come on the scene effectively 
And now God himself will speak uh, on the prophet's behalf. And so as we press on into verse 7, we see this idea here that says, Thus says the Lord, right? Now it's not God said to me and I'm relaying it to you. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, that is the Holy One of Israel, to the one who is despised, to the one that the nation abhors, to a servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise, princes will also bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. We see here God come on the scene and give his response, right? We get a change of perspective here. No longer is the voice of the prophet speaking for God. Now it's God himself. Thus says the Lord. And what he says is he describes himself in a particular way that's interesting to us, right? He describes himself in a way, I am God, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, I am Jehovah. That's what's there instead of the Lord, right? He uses his name, right? It'd be like me saying, I am Kevin. Right? He says, I am Jehovah God, the Redeemer, the Holy One to Israel. That's who I am. And then he says, now I'm directing this statement to somebody. Right? I am the Redeemer of Israel. I am their Holy One. And I say to, and it's to the servant, it's to the servant, but what does he call him? He doesn't say to the mighty and awesome servant that I appointed. He says, to the one who was despised by the nation. To the one that they abhorred. I was Israel's redeemer, and I sent my prophet, I sent him to my people, and they abhorred him. They wanted nothing to do with him. They despised him, right? Which is why vindication had to come from God himself. I am God, I am your holy one, Israel, and the one I sent to you, you abhorred. But not only is he the one who was despised by the nation, but he was the one who serves kings, right? It's an interesting idea because these, these songs, these things are considered to be messianic and will be quoted by uh, the New Testament writers to demonstrate they spoke of Jesus concerning these things. And when you think about Jesus a lot of times, I think a lot of times we think about him as the one who was despised, the one who was abhorred by the nation. Right? We think about him in that way. The nation rejected him. They did not have anything to do with him. Uh, but do we often think about him as the one who was serving kings? Right? I don't think we think about him in that way very often. But he was a servant to the king. Not only the king of heaven himself, but what he will say here is he serves kings in such a way because here's a prophecy concerning the servant. While the nation has abhorred him and rejected him, kings will honor and princes will come and bow down. These people from other places, these rulers from other places will look and they will see something bigger than themselves, a servant, but they will see someone bigger than themselves and they will come and they will bow down before him. And there's an interesting idea behind it when we ask, why is that going to be, God? Why is it going to work out that way? Why will the nation abhor him, but the one who is despised kings will eventually come and bow down to him? Why is that? And the answer is, right there in the text for us, what? Because God is faithful. Isn't that interesting? We were talking about that in the class here just this morning, right? Uh, that God is faithful. That's who he is. That's what he's about. It's the way in which he tends to operate. People will look and say, God, it appears as though you've rejected and you've neglected. And look at all these bad things that happen, right? And it even happened to his chosen servant. And yet, what do we see in the end? God is faithful. And what we see here in this case is God is faithful to complete his chosen mission, right? He says, I picked you from when? Before the womb. I chose you to do this mission. And if I chose you to do this mission before the womb, before you were even upon the earth itself, if I chose you for that, do you really think that the nation can get in my way? No, I will complete my mission that I chose you for. You will be exalted. And God will now give his testimony as we saw the servant give his own in verses 8 through 13 here. Here's what it says. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I will answer you. In a day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the land 
to make them possess its desolate inheritances, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those in darkness, be shown. Along the roads they will graze, their pasture will be on all the barren heights. They will not hunger or thirst, nor scorching wind or sun strike them, for their compassionate one will lead them and will guide them by springs of water. I will make all my mountains a road and my highways will be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar. Behold, these from the north and from the south and from the west and from the land of Sinim. Shout for joy, heavens. Rejoice, earth. Break forth into ringing shouts, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and he has compassion on his afflicted. To close the song, what we will get is God's testimony. We will get God speaking for himself, not the mouth of the prophet. And he will say, let me tell you what I will do. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He says, I will answer and help the servant. Right? In the day of salvation, I will answer you. I will help you in the day that I choose. Right? Just like we saw in those same uh, life of David as we've looked through the Psalms. Right? He calls out in his time of need. He calls out in his desperation. And who is always faithful to respond? God is always faithful to respond. And in the day of salvation... He delivers. He says, this is what I will do. I will reach out to you. And he says, I will make the servant, I will make you despised one, but the one that I exalt, I will make you a covenant to the people. You, servant, will become a covenant to the people. Now, as we look at that idea then, and we think about the idea of a covenant, we understand there's going to be some sort of terms about that, right? Well, what What do you mean by that? What is going to be the covenant that you will be? What will be uh, its details? What will be its uh, contract, if you will? And he says, here's what it is. He says, I will make you a covenant of the people, and you will be a covenant of restoration. Right? I will make you a covenant of restoration, he says. He says, you will go and you will restore the land and make them possess its desolate inheritance. You will restore them. And we saw earlier where he says, you will restore Jacob. You will bring them back. You will do good things for them. That will happen. And he says here, he follows up with that. That will occur. You will restore my people. He says, secondly, though, that you will be a covenant of freedom for them. Right? You will take those ones, he says, and he says, come out. Bring them out of the dungeon. Bring them out of the places where they've been held. Uh, We saw that last time uh, in uh, Isaiah 42 as well, this idea that those in dungeons and darkness he will draw out and they will see the light. Remember, oh, so bright and blinding uh, is the picture that we get there. He says it again here. It will bring freedom to those who are captive. Now, when we think about that idea, there's two things going on there. One, Israel was captive, right? Israel was taken. Israel was bound up in these things. Uh, of their own captivity that God had brought on them. But who was he talking to? If you remember at the beginning, who does the prophet say? Listen up who? All you out there, islands and peoples, right? Uh, And so when we think about that idea, there's a freedom that's being brought to them that's different than captivity from physical things because they weren't in that. There's a freedom that's being brought to them that we see fulfilled today when we talk about uh, God says, I have redeemed you and brought you back from what? Sin and death, right? I've bought you out of that. I've given you something other. I've put you instead in my kingdom. And he says, third, you will be a covenant of light. They will look, and he says to those in darkness, look, see, be shown, be known. I will bring you into the light, as we saw last week. You'll be set as a light for the Gentiles, he says. And when we think of those things, that's really good. That's a nice thing, right? I've been restored, I've been freed, I've been set out in the light. But I could do all of those things for you, and I could be like, all right, have a good day. Hope things work out for you. See you later. Right? I did my job. I said, make the best you can in the world. Right? Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. I have no idea. But I know in movies a lot of times, a lot of movies will start with this premise of there's a guy in prison. Right? And maybe he's wrongfully accused because he's our hero. So usually he's wrongfully accused. Right? And that's why he's there. Uh, and his time is up. Right? And his time is up. And he gets his little box of possessions back. And then there's always the scene. There's like the front gate. And again, I don't know if prisons even look like this. There's the front gate, and they put him outside, and they close the gate, and they just leave him there. And, you, and it's like, good luck to you. And some, some friend pulls up in his car. Hey, good, you're out. Hop on in, right? whatever the deal is. Right? But that's sort of the way. Hey, I let you go. Hope everything works out. 
But that's not what the picture is here, right? God doesn't come and say, I've redeemed you and bought you, and I leave you on the side of the road and say, oh, things are good for you. No, instead he says, forth, you will be a covenant of security, right? You will not be left to your own defenses. I will guide you. I will lead you. I will show you in the way. You will have security from the dangers that are about. Uh, You won't hunger or thirst or the scorching sun and wind beat upon you and kill you. I will give you shelter. I will make you secure. And in fact, not only will you be secure, but finally he says you will be a covenant of uh, fullness. You'll be a covenant of fullness for these people, right? He says their pasture will be all along even the barren heights right those places that we thought were barren and empty they will be full you will go and you will graze even there right you will not hunger nor will you thirst because i will guide you by these springs of water all the mountains in fact will be a road for you all of these things will be yours because there will be a covenant of fullness that i make you for these people when we think about what we have, we will talk about that a lot of times, right? In the New Testament, we see this idea that all of the blessings and all of the fullness is found there in Christ. And God is telling this beforehand. He's letting the people know this. And he says this, and he does this to say, uh, not only will I answer and help the servant, not only will I make him a covenant to the people, but I will draw those from afar. Right? Sort of how he began, he ends as well. I will draw all of those from afar. You see this idea expressed when he says, uh, Behold, they will come from afar, from all of these different locations, but also in the fact where he says, I will raise up every road, and I will make all these paths come here, right, to this place. You will be the one to draw from afar all of these people. You will bring them into this location, into this place. And because of that, he sort of concludes with this idea, I will cause rejoicing. I will cause rejoicing. There's this picture I almost get uh, as this lays out here. There's certain ideas that seem expressed to me uh, as he says these different things of the servant that aren't clear, right? They're not explicitly stated, but there's almost this picture as he speaks to those afar, but who is hearing it? Not just those afar, Isaiah is a Jew, right? He's speaking to the people of Israel, literally. Uh, And as he says these things, I can almost imagine they get this picture or these pictures in their mind of their own history. I get these pictures in their mind of their own history where he says, I will bring you into this place and into this freedom, right? And I think of them as like thinking of Moses, the one who brought them out of slavery out of Egypt. And he's sort of like, yeah, this guy's going to be better than Moses. And you get this idea when he talks about uh, coming into this fullness and coming into this land and coming into this greatness and security. And they think of, they think of Joshua, right? Leading them in and taking over the land that flows with milk and honey. And it's like, yeah, you're going to be better than Joshua. And then I think of this idea where it talks about, uh, and people will come from afar, kings and princes will come from afar to bring honor uh, to this one. And they might think of themselves of, of David or of Solomon, right? And people came from miles and miles away to hear of the wisdom of Solomon. He goes, and you know what? It's going to be better than that. Kings will come from all over a place to bring glory, but who to who? To bring glory to Solomon? No, no, no. To bring glory and honor and rejoicing to God himself. Rejoice, shout for joy, heaven and earth. Break forth and ringing shouts, O mountains. Why? What's the reason? Because he's so wise, right, like Solomon was? Because he brought freedom like Moses did? Because he did? No, why? What does it say? It says, bring all of these shouts of joy because of his comfort and his compassion. Because the servant has comforted his own people. He has brought comfort to those who were his and because he has compassion on who? On all of the afflicted. On all of those who are afflicted, uh, the Lord has brought salvation. He's brought compassion to them. We sometimes get this picture or this mind, we need to be reminded of it anyway, that it's amazing that God was up in heaven and he looked down and he saw people down there. Right? He saw people that were afflicted. He saw people that had it rough. He saw people that had it difficult. And he saw this problem they had they could never solve. They could never solve. And what did he do? He said, he moved. I have compassion on him. I want to fix this for them. And he came down and he did that. Isn't that a weird thing? You might say, no, that's very obvious, that's very evident, that's of course how it would be. But I'd ask you to go and consider the people of the world today. 
consider humanity as a whole. How many times would you say that those who are in high positions of power and have everything and their, their everything is great, they look down and they see people that have it rough and people that are afflicted and they go, I'm going to help them. I'm going to move heaven and earth and I'm going to give of my own self to do that. Is that what we do? Or do we usually say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, man. Fix it yourself. I'm a self-made person. I did this all on my own. You should too. That's kind of human way, right? So it's quite an impressive thing that God would look down with compassion and not only would he say, I'm going to help my people, but he says, you know what? Too little of a thing just to save these ones. Right? I chose these people and made a covenant with them and they messed it up. I, I feel bad. I should help them out. But then he says, too small. I'm going I'm to do it for everybody. The whole world. People that hate me. People that despise me. People that are just saying, God is terrible. I've been... I'm going to do it for them, too. I'm going to, get, I'm going to open the doors to everyone. That's what God was like. And when we think of it in that way, then we can say, uh, like Isaiah does here, break forth into ringing shouts. Give glory and rejoice, O earth and heavens, because God has done this thing. And so we think and we close out sort of this second uh, song. We get a picture of who this servant's going to be. Now we can start to see this beautiful picture of salvation that the servant will bring and that he's bringing for who? That he's bringing for all. He's bringing for everyone. And so we'll continue to see this servant develop as we look at the next song next time. But we're uh, out of time for today. So let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you and we are thankful for um, for Isaiah, for his message that you used him as your conduit to bring uh, these beautiful songs to us about who your uh, promised Messiah was going to be. Uh, we know that people throughout time have said, oh, these things aren't about a, a prophecy or they're not about the Christ. And yet we see very clearly stated uh, in the New Testament that these things are so, that they're applied uh, to Jesus and to his apostles as things are happening that they say, and they, they cite from these psalms and songs. And so uh, we're grateful that before these things occurred, uh, you spoke them aloud so we would know them to be true that we could say of you, uh, even as you said here, that idols have never done these things, but only the God of heaven could reveal these things before they happen. But Father, we're so grateful uh, that you gave humanity a hope way back then that salvation was coming, that you carried it out uh, far before our time, so we now have that great blessing uh, where we, we don't have to live in that state of looking forward uh, for when the salvation would come, but it's near, it's at hand, and we can take advantage of it uh, today. We're so grateful that Jesus came and he did these things for us. We're so grateful that uh, we see these things carried out in his life, that he did come, that he spoke your message, but that he was despised and rejected, uh, and yet you vindicated him when you raised him up, uh, that you made him a light to all the nations around, and you, you made kings and princes and people of power come to see uh, who he truly was. Father, we're grateful of that. We pray that you would help us to recognize that in our lives each and every day. We pray that you would help us to... Uh, when times are tough, remember that we have hope in you and that you will also vindicate us as we remain faithful to you for your faithful. We're grateful for all of these things. We're grateful that we can come to you in this way because of that uh, conduit we have through Jesus, your son. We pray these things in his name. Amen. We're going to sing the song. Uh, that